good. And uh, yeah, so today we're happy to have Sergey to give us an informal Thursday seminar about uh, uh, black holes, love numbers, and infinite symmetry. Okay, thank you. It's always fun to give a talk at Stanford, even remotely. It's good to see familiar faces. Uh, so I should say I, I got my good share of Greek collaborators from Stanford, but none of them well present such a big challenge in terms of pronouncing the first and the last name. So the, I, I'm, I'm not trying to pronounce the first name of the, uh, our first author here, but it's a very good PhD student, Panas Charalampus and Misha Ivanov. So we have two papers on the subject and there is more in progress. Uh, and I should say, well, first of this paper, it's something like 60 pages long, it took us a year to write it. And the second is six pages long, it took 10 days to write. And I will mostly talk about the second paper, uh, but there is a reason that first paper is there because this whole subject is about kind of set of calculations which were done over last decade or so. Uh, and these calculations were producing uh, some puzzling results well, basically they're producing zeros, but I think as I try to explain, it, it's really, these cal calculations were calculated in certain quantities which are not, a priori one may think they're not really well defined. And somehow the results were better defined than one way would expect a priori. And I said, there were actually somewhat nice results. There were lots of zeros there. Uh, and that's uh, what we're trying to understand. Uh, and also I should say right away, well, I don't feel that kind of it's what, what I have to say today is a full resolution of, of the, the, the story. Actually, I'm kind of in this happy stage now when the more I think about it, the more I'm confused about what's, what's really going on. Uh, but I think it's higher level confusion than it, it was before. So, and I'll, I'll come to confusions at the end, but first let me try to explain um, what's going on. So this talk and these calculations are about what's called called black hole, uh, tidal, uh, love numbers. Uh, and well, I, I'll start with defining what love numbers are. I think one of the biggest challenge in this whole project was really to understand what, what is being calculated. And that's what took us like a year and that long paper, that's, that's what it is mo mostly about. Uh, so there are several definitions. I'll start with the most kind of uh, uh, down to earth one, but it's not the best definition, but still it's like what it's natural to call GR definition. Uh, and it goes back to somewhere 2009, probably the work of Eric Poisson and others, but really it goes back to like this hundred years ago. It's, it's really, a, well, not in the context of black holes, but in the context of like more general gravitating bodies. Uh, so let me start first with the Newtonian context. So if you have Newtonian gravity, so you're thinking about something like Earth and there is a moon sitting here, uh, then uh, we all know about tides. So there is a uh, tidal force on, on the, of the uh, moon on the Earth, uh, Earth gets deformed. Uh, and uh, the way to characterize this, so if one looks at the uh, potential of the, of the Earth, uh, uh, one should look at it uh, kind of, one treats this, 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 this distance is essentially infinity and one uh, looks far away from the Earth. So this picture of course is not up to scale. So one looks at uh, far away such that Earth can also already be treated as, as a point like particle, but uh, somehow like one looks here. So roughly uh, still also far, far away from the moon. And then the potential can be written as a sum of several contributions. So first of all, Oh, there is just uh, 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 gravitational potential of the Earth, uh, of un unperturbed Earth. Earth. Uh, then uh, there is, uh, if I look, if I expand it in spherical harmonics uh, and look at a particular uh, uh, value of uh, angular number L, uh, then there will be a term which can be written like R to the L that comes from 
uh, Taylor expanded the external potential of the moon around the origin. So R here is a di distance uh, distant to the earth. So the, the way to think about this term is uh, because moon is very, very far away, we can Taylor expand its gravitational potential in the vicinity of the earth and it will be some growing contribution. And so in the else uh, partial wave, it will go, grow like R to the L. Uh, well, and then there will be a decaying piece here. We'll just solve in linear Poisson equation. Uh, so there will be a piece which can be written this way, R to minus L minus one. And here I indicated the possibility, well, as it happens for actual earth and moon, that moon rotates around the earth. So there is some frequency dependence here. Uh, so which uh, creates uh, time dependent tidal force. And this coefficient K of omega, uh, that that coefficient uh, characterizes uh, the tidal response, so the gravitational potential, which arises as a consequence of the tidal deformation of the Earth due to the presence of the Moon. Uh, and uh, that's that. This coefficient will be the main uh, hero of the story. Uh, so and Sergei, so the, yeah. the second term is also time dependent with frequency omega. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I kind of I I I normalize it to one, so I I I just look this this phi which I'm growing yeah so it's kind of I can write it phi sub l sub sub omega so I expanded it in in Fourier uh, okay. so it's it's a response at given omega and then I, I normalized uh, the this 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 coefficient to one. So you, can you unambiguously differentiate between the second and the third term? Because well, I'll come back. I'll, I'll come. I'll come. Get, I'll get there. But so far, I'm talking about really Newtonian gravity, right? So this is linear equation. It's a Poisson equation. So what is written here, it's, it's just exact. That's the all terms which are there, mm -hmm. right? Well, and I shouldn't really have. Yeah. So yeah, I'm being very. So so this term is not really. That's not part of the. Uh, it's 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 spherically symmetric part. So if I talk about else spherical harmonics, then there is no M O R. It's really all what one gets there is these two terms, right? So that's a general solution of Poisson equation. Well, these so, two terms and then more subleading terms that go to higher power. So you say not- No, no, if you solve Poisson equation, that's that's the most general, okay. that's the solution, right? So okay. without, with, without sources, that, that's all what you have. So in Newtonian gravity, it's pretty unambiguous what, 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 what this K, K, K coefficient is. But what you're asking indeed, that's kind of the source of some confusions about well, well, we'll get there momentarily. So sorry, the well, last term, does it have minus L minus one or just L plus one? Sorry, it's- It's yeah. already in the- Yeah, it's L plus one in the denominator. Yeah, it's 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 a decayed, decayed piece. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thanks, sorry for that. Okay, and uh, then uh, it's also it's often convenient to tailor expand all uh, this. Uh, well, if, if somehow we talk about frequencies which are small, uh, then uh, the, uh, this response will be a uh, analytic function at om of omega. So it's one can uh, tell or expand this in omega. And so there will be a term like uh, it's approximation that one treats Earth as a just spherically symmetric uh, non rotating body. It will be, uh, there will be a, a, oops, this first term static response, and that's what's called static love number in this context, and well, that's what original love number. And this is some dissipative contribution. Uh, and one thing which will play, well it, it, well, it will be important momentarily, is that instead if we now take into account the fact that Earth rotates, uh, then actually uh, for rotating body, uh, then uh, it will get modified just as a result of rotation, uh, the response will take this form, omega minus m omega, where uh, this is the uh, angular velocity of of the Earth, uh, and m is there now azimuthal uh, quantum number. If I also expand everything now in harmonics, because it's not a spherical symmetric problem anymore, so then response will look this way and this this prefactor well it should be familiar for those who uh, looked in superadiance so that's the quantity on which everything uh, depends there and this is just to say that uh, when when there is no spherical symmetry so you see now even if we look at the static response at zero omega then there are two contributions there is this one 
which is kind of genuine conservative static response, but then there is a contribution coming from rotation. Uh, so the, it arises to the fact that in the rest frame of the, of the rotating, rest frame of the body, there, there, is, uh, uh, on, there is dissipation, but then when you go to a rotating frame, then this dissipation appears now it is, is a static res response, but it's, I, oops, it enters with extra factor of I. So one can distinguish uh, this one from, from what's called love number. It will be important at some point late, later. So, and well, basically what was attempted in these papers starting from Poisson in this GR work, uh, people were generalizing it uh, to full Einstein theory. And in particular, uh, well, 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 there is people definitely talk about these uh, responses for neutron stars, which are already uh, known uh, kind of relativistic objects. But uh, what uh, 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 was initiated by Poisson and company that uh, people started talking about tidal responses of black holes. And as uh, Victor already suggested, well, it's somewhat less, uh, less clear that these uh, responses are really well-defined quantities. Uh, because theory is nonlinear, and so here, so the, uh, this expression here is not really the full solution. So each of them, so there is a leading term, uh, well, solves linearized equation, and far away it looks like an Einstein equation, but still the full solution is some series, and uh, so the leading term goes like R to the L, but then there are some leading terms, and looking at these subleading terms, we are interested in, par in part subleading term with one particular asymptotics, and it's not clear that this is really well defined. So it looks like there is a possibility like for mixture between kind of what comes from the source and what comes from the response. Uh, and moreover, it's not also clear that uh, this definition is really uh, gauge invariant that by changing uh, coordinates one kind of that, that if one tries to define it this way, uh, then uh, but th this number that doesn't change. Uh, so to address these issues, it's better to use the, uh, what I will call EFT definition. Uh, and it's uh, related to the uh, word line effective theory by uh, Walter Goldberg and the IRS team and by Rafael Porto for, well, this is the approach, modern approach uh, for calculating, say, uh, analytically calculating uh, gravitational uh, waveforms from, uh, from uh, like whole binaries, for instance. And so the way, uh, the way this cal calculation is organized, so you have a uh, black hole binary uh, and you want to like, you're interested in waveform which it emits. And so here LIGA sits somewhere far away. Uh, and uh, well, at early stages of, uh, of the binary when uh, the separation between black holes is still far uh, much larger than their size. So that's when one can do some analytical uh, calculations. But then, uh, well, it's a kind of typical uh, EFT problems. There are two scales here, the size of the black holes and of the size set uh, by, by the separation. Uh, and so the approach is that one writes uh, uh, world line, so one treats uh, black holes as point like particles, well, composite point like particles. So there, there are some high dimensional operators on the world line and one writes uh, the world line action uh, for, 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 uh, for, for these particles. And then one finds effective potential by integrating potential modes. One finds uh, effective Hamiltonian, which describes interaction of these particles and solves this Hamiltonian and then calculates the, uh, the radiation. But uh, all my talk, it's not about that kind of second part of the problem. The, the, this, this talk is really about a word line uh, action for a, a single black hole. Uh, and uh, so to make my life simpler, just to avoid uh, extra technicalities. So, so let's, instead of talking about full GR, let me consider the toy model when I have black hole, which interacts with external field phi. 
So well, practically everything what I have to say about this model will, 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 will get translated also in the full GR context, but it just saves me uh, time on writing indices and using Newman Penrose stuff and all that. So, but all, all conceptual uh, difficulties are there and also at the technical level at the end of the day, it's, it works the same way in the scalar field case in the, in the full GR. Uh, and then, roughly speaking, so the in this case, the actually, uh, uh, yeah. uh, I, I don't know if you are gonna talk about this or if maybe it's not relevant, but uh, I always have this confusion about this word line picture because how do I couple a point source? How do I put a point source in the Einstein equation? Isn't it because? I, but uh, what, what's the problem? But, but... Well, I guess I don't, I, I hit the horizon before getting to the, to the point source. No, no, but if you look from, if you look from far away, you are, you, like horizon is at a point for you. You're not resolving the horizon. The information that it's black hole rather than some, something else, it's all encoded in the effective action which which you write on the on the world line. Uh, horizon is the cutoff, right? So for this. Yeah, uh, horizon. Yes, well, for this effective field theory, right? Mm -hmm. For this effective field theory, exactly. Well, so the size of the black hole is really the is a UV, UV cutoff, right? It doesn't. The the point particle does not interact with radiation whose wavelength is shorter than the cutoff, which is a horizon scale. So you cannot right, so yeah, so this effective field theory, it's written, it's a, it's a, it, it, it's effective field theory with a, there is a U, UV cutoff, we said by the size of the black hole, by size of, by the horizon, and then kind of then in the full, the, the, what uh, Walter and I are, the, what they're doing, then they're separating kind of potential modes and radiation modes, and they integrated out potential modes to get this like effective Hamiltonian, which would describe uh, the radiation modes. Uh, emission of radiation modes, but and if I don't care about that part, I really care about well, just uh, uh, writing uh, action like matching it roughly the horizon size. Sorry, right? sorry, can I, so you're matching yeah. at the horizon size, but you're interested in tidal forces, so you're interested in the extent of the probe, right? The spatial expen extent of the probe, right? But I'm interested in the tidal force at in, uh, in the small frequency limit. So in the limit, well, actually mo most of the talk will be really about static response, about zero frequency limit. So I'm, I'm interested in the uh, tidal response at frequencies much smaller than the size and RS, than the, the, size, the size of the black hole. And that's why I can treat it uh, with an effective field theory, treating the, uh, looking- You mean size tidal. much greater? Well, I mean, frequency is much smaller than. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the, okay. So you're so, I don't know. Well, I mean, tidal forces. I just think of some extended object that gets, you know, that gets pulled apart by the tidal force. So that's what you're going to be talking about, but not at the scale of the horizon. That that's more or less. Well, let me maybe, maybe write the kind of formula. Maybe it will be more more clear uh, what what's going on. So in so in this language. So if I'm interested in the uh, uh, linear. Uh, tidal response. So the way one models the black hole, there is a leading term, just there is a point particle. Now, because of no hair theorem, uh, the black hole doesn't act as a source for the field phi. Uh, so there is no terms uh, li linear in phi on the world line. But then there are terms like this, let me like say, okay, uh, I will be writing it in the, uh, uh, in the uh, rest frame of the black hole. So, so that's why there are only spatial derivatives here. And so there will be terms like this K2, D, roughly di, dj, phi squared, plus etc. So there are like high dimensional operators which I can write on the world line with the arbitrary number of spatial derivatives. In principle, I can also write terms, in principle, I can also write terms with like, uh, KT with some uh, time derivatives acting on phi. And that would, so these terms would be respondent, uh, uh, responsible for uh, frequency dependent uh, responses. Uh, but 
uh, more, most of this talk will be about this uh, spatial responses. Uh, and uh, so, and so th then when, uh, so, in, sorry, in sorry, language, I was trying, sorry, I was muted. Th this quantity starts life as, as the world line action. And then the other terms are. Uh, no, these are all, these are, this, all these terms are world line terms. So there is a. They're, they're all world line terms. Good. Yeah. Okay. So there's, yeah. for phi is a bulk field. So there is a yes, bulk, yes, a, yes, bulk yes. action. Okay, okay, okay. No, I, I got you. Okay. So, right. And then there is this linear li quadratic terms, which one can write, write on the world line. And these terms, so these coefficients, so for instance, these coefficients in front of the terms, which don't involve uh, the time derivatives, they will, will correspond to this uh, t static tidal, tidal responses. Well, because if one solves uh, equation of phi, then there will be uh, well, there will be linear contribution coming from localized on the on the word line associated with these terms, uh, and uh, yeah, it's exactly correspond to the to the effect of. Uh, those tidal responses which are present there. So that's actually, well, what I said here, it's, it's very oversimplified uh, because the whole story was of course much more interesting because well, as we know very well, so black hole is far from being just composite particle. There are lots of degrees of freedom which live on the black hole. So the, the better way to, to say about it, it's really, there is uh, this field phi. So in addition to these terms, which one may write, there are also there are also terms kind of of, of this kind schematically infinitely many terms of of this kind where uh, like O correspond to some if one thinks about black hole as some uh, quantum system so it, it characterized by some set of operators which live on the Born line uh, and uh, the uh, so there are terms like this which correspond to all possible coupling linear coupling of the field phi to this. To this upper world line operators, uh, and then uh, the full response. So, but really should use kind of some schwinger keltos formalism to describe this full response. And full response schematically, it's given. It comes from the sum of the two-point function of these operators O plus there is a contribution from this uh, uh, world line local local terms which one can write on the world line. Uh, so the full response comes from uh, uh, the, these two pictures from summing up those two contributions. But actually I think, yeah, let, let me spend some time because this whole setup is actually very similar to what people were doing kind of in the early, not even ADS CFT, but pre ADS CFT correspondence days, right? When people were, uh, and the people were doing calculations of the following kind. kind. So we're considering high dimensional black holes, which in that case, well, the standard example is like P brains, which produced by a uh, stack of D3, D3 brains. So, and, uh, uh, and that's really how, well, I wasn't around, but my understanding is that's how it is CFT was born. Uh, so uh, so if, you, if one considers uh, uh, extremal uh, P, brain, P brain like that, uh, then uh, what was being done uh, that kind of the full action can be thought as a action. There is kind of bulk gravity, which lives in here, which lives in the kind of asymptotically flat region. And in, in my previous slide that corresponds to kind of represented by this field phi, which, which lives in the bulk. Uh, then there is a quantum system, which described by the brain, well, in, in the most, well studied example that's n equal four super young meals which lives on the stack of uh, these three brains uh, and then uh, there is also uh, in principle well, there is part of the action which describes interaction between the two right and then well, if you read the uh, review on idea safety by a Haronian friend then kind of the argument for idea safety is essentially that if one takes low energy limit then s interaction goes to zero and on one hand side, one finds that there is a bulk gravity and n equal four superior milch, which lives on, on the stack of D brains. But on the other hand, when one thinks about this geometry, then one finds again, bulk gravity plus full string theory, which lives in ADS quasi ADS throat. 
and that's essentially how uh, a, a, the CFT was was discovered. And the calculations people were doing to probe uh, are kind of these two point functions in, in superannuals again were very similar. So one was considering scattering absorption cross section of like different bulk fields, which uh, which go in, into um, uh, into on the stack of brains and this absorption cross section so sigma absorption it's related to, to uh, imaginary part of uh, two point function of these operators or which in that particular case we knew where they're coming from they're coming from n equal postperineal meals so the, the absorption cross section were determined in this imaginary parts and then uh, from this imaginary part one can reconstruct the full correlator up to local terms uh, and so, well, but then if one assumes some uh, uh, UV asymptotics and essentially one deconstructs the full correlator, but these local terms, as I say, these are exactly these love numbers we're talking about. And I think maybe people may, may correct me, but I think the right way to think about this. So these terms, they really, then they describe not the kind of the CFT itself, but they rather describe Right, they release its self and in, self interaction part. So they 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 describe roughly how one glues together this quantum system, which describes black hole and the the bulk bulk bulk, bulk modes. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of what these love numbers are about. So they they characterize kind of in, in this language they characterize how one glues together th th these two systems. So these are, so, I'm, I'm a bit confused in the in the action above that you have for black hole and scalar field. So you have this phi O, but isn't the idea of this effective field theory that you integrate out degrees of freedom and make up O, and you just generate? Well, but, no, but you cannot integrate because O because there, there, are, there are so soft modes kind of well. So what what would be an example? Because you're not. O? Well. It's it's n equal four if n equal four super and meals which leaves uh, just in the in the, the black hole case what would be in, in the well, but we, well we don't know what these are but but also we know if well because especially when we're not talking about extremal black hole then we're not uh, we're not in a vacuum state of that quantum system right so uh, but how, so that's, how, that's why one needs so you say you cannot really calculate the full response from this EFT formalism because there are some unknown operators. All that. Uh, well, one you, you characterize you characterize full response in terms of these two point functions of these operators, or and just like it was done in old days, kind of DSCFT, and that's really cool. What one extracts these two point functions from doing. Uh, matching calculation from looking at the scattering of low frequency gravitational waves or scalar fields of black hole. And that, that, allow, that allows us to extract uh, this imaginary through relate absorption cross section to imaginary part of O. So one exactly uses this formalism. So one looks at the single black hole, one does this uh, low, low frequency scattering. From there, one determines this, uh, this uh, two point function, and then one goes and then one uses it now in two body calculation. Uh, uh, but, but also on the way, one determines. So, in addition to scattering, so in addition to absorption uh, uh, coefficients, there are also uh, these uh, local terms one can write on the world line, which correspond kind of to roughly local part of this response, a part of this response which can be characterized just by local operators on the, on the world line, but rather than dissipative effect associated to the presence of degrees of freedom on the world line. So that's kind of, thing, in this language, that's what these lab numbers are about. So I think they're, they're really about how one glues kind of quantum system which characterizes black hole, one can glue this to the rest, the rest of the space time. Okay, so, well, and so in principle, so this language, so it makes it manifest at least that, yeah, so there are, Kind of in this effective field theory framework, so these are gauge invariant quantities. One can talk about them, uh, and in principle, one by doing matching calculation, one can distinguish them. Well, they're well defined. Well, but that it raises actually other questions because these are coefficients in front of like infinite series of higher dimensional operators. Well, in principle, one expect. Uh, that uh, these coefficients may run, right? So th there is now different in this language, there is different source of ambiguity. So my whole talk, I should say, it will be about 
classical classical jar. I'm not doing quantum calculation, but even at the classical level, one may, when we, one does this uh, matching calculation, one in general expects that these higher dimensional operators they would exhibit logarithmic running, uh, uh, and so that's now another worry. Uh, which one may have to kind of to what extent these numbers are really scheme independent to what to what extent these numbers are really well defined not because of some gauge ambiguity or some nonlinearity well it's related to nonlinearities this running is kind of related to the fact that there are nonlinearities in the theory so it's it's really it's the same worry but expressed in slightly slightly different language okay now let me so if there are no questions about kind of what 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 objects are being discussed let me now give you some kind of summary of experimental facts about these quantities. By experimental, I mean, um, which came out of a result of the calculations which people were doing over uh, the last decade or so. So, okay, so first of all, so facts. Uh, so first of all, uh, in D equal four for four dimensional black holes, uh, for Schwarzschild black holes, if A is equal to zero, uh, then, there is no running. And moreover, actually, all these Wilson coefficients were found to be zero. So they, they all vanish. And that's kind of what motivate, like from the this EFT viewpoint that represents some kind of uh, some big puzzle. It's can some uh, an example of fine tuning. So you have infinite set of Wilson coefficients, which seem to be vanished without no, no symmetry reason for that. So that Raphael Porter in particular was really uh, advertising this problem a lot. At least that's how I, I got uh, into the subject by listening to his talks and talks by Ira. Uh, now, uh, then there were calculations uh, done at D equal, D larger than four, again for a equals zero for Schwarzschild black holes. Uh, these calculations were done uh, in 2011 by Cole and Smolkin. And recently last last year, Lam Hui of his collaborators, they kind of uh, like redid them and clarified many uh, confusing points which were, were there, but the results were correct, which were um, um, uh, back in uh, Cole and Smolkin paper. So- uh, Can I ask it? Yeah. So this running should I think of it as being induced by the like uh, if I consider a higher dimension operator as being induced by the loops of the lower dimension ones. Loops. Well, but is that, is that class? Yeah, it's, it's induced by classical nonlinearities, right? But I, I guess it should, it should in some language it does correspond. I guess I want to understand right. if right. is there is the is no running and all k equal to zero are they basically equivalent statement or they are two independent? Oh, they, no, they are, no, they are two. As you well, you see momentarily, they are two independent statements, and you'll see. So by d, d larger than four, what happens is the following. So for generic k, and I should say yeah. So before in in my Newtonian discussion, I used this. Uh, expansion in spherical harmonics. And that just this number L in this language just corresponds to terms with different number of uh, spatial derivatives acting on phi. So that corresponds to K with different, in front of different operators. And so uh, the situation was the following. So for generic L, for generic azimuthal number L, uh, there is no running. And these quantities are non-zero. So these are just well-defined like fundamental constants characterizing black holes. They are non-zero and they don't run. And then sometimes for some special values, uh, for some special values of L, they turn out to be zero. And sometimes for some other special values of L, they run. So all three situations were present. Uh, and uh, well, that looked like a mess and was somewhat puzzling. Uh, and finally, uh, what, what happened over the last year uh, in D equal four, A not equal to zero. So there was a paper by Lutiek from last year, Cheer from last year, and also our paper, our first paper was about that, about curve black holes. Uh, so there was a bit of a confu confusion there, but in the end, the situation is the, the following. So 
yeah, it's related to the effect which I was referring to in the, in the uh, beginning. So uh, here, static response is not zero. And it's, but it turns out that this, this full static response, it can be attributed just to this effect of rotation. So in other words, uh, so there is, uh, there is static response, but it's uh, purely, purely dissipative. So it's all coming from uh, frame dragging. So in, in other words, all these Wilson coefficients for curved black holes in four dimensions, they still all zero and there is no running. Uh, so basically that's, but that's a set of puzzles which I want to explain. So uh, but again, yeah. you can, uh, if, the, if, if there is running, doesn't it mean that say, the, um, doesn't it mean that the, the, they are not well defined or I have to say, uh, put some kind of uh, the scale to talk about. Yeah, yeah, this right. Point. Yes, that's exactly what running means. That you need to specify renormalization scale. Oh, like setting k, saying that k equal to zero, it has to come with no running. Yeah. yeah so for exactly for k equal to zero to be a sensible statement, it should also come with the statement that there is no running. But uh, what happens at d equal four? So there were situations when the k is not equal to zero, but still there is no running. So, so it goes one way, but not another. So no running is on its own interesting statement. And actually, yeah, I think the thinking which people had, so that's all kind of suggests of the presence of some symmetry. Well, unless it's really example of some remarkable fine tuning, but so it, that's all these facts suggest uh, of the presence due some hidden algebraic structure, which would explain what's going on. Uh, but the, I think people who thought about this, the thinking was, well, probably this symmetry is special for D equal four because at D larger than four, in general, these things, they, they don't vanish. But actually the fact that they don't, they don't run, that's already something which, which requires explanation. Uh, so actually situation, it's just, it's more rich and D, D larger than four, but it's definitely also re requires some, what's going on requires some explanation. Uh, and as we'll see, indeed there is some uh, and the algebraic structure, which explains it, but it's not spe special for D equal four. What's special for D equal four is something else, which I'll explain, explain momentarily. Okay, so yeah, so I finally, I managed to explain what are the quantities we're talking about and what is the set of puzzles which we're, we're trying to explain. So let me now come to explanation if there are no more questions in this stage. Sorry, and, and running again, you see it like in practice in this action that appears or there's some logarithm in, uh, in this coefficient. Well, yeah, that's one way to say it, but yeah, because but kind of the way you do, how, how do, what the calculation you do to determine this quantity, it's just it's much in calculation, right? There is a microscopic theory, which is kind of full GR or like scalar field coupled in the black hole background. And you can solve this Klein-Gordon equation in black hole background. And then you, uh, that's a microscopic calculation, but then you do EFT calculation where the, your EFT is this again, this field phi, which propagates in the, now in the flat bulk, but, they, but it interacts with point source, which, which and, and self interacts also, you know, interacts with metric created by the source. Uh, and so you you compare the two calculations you, and from those from the comparison you did use what the coefficients k you need to put on the word line for the two calculations to match and running correspond to the situation when kind of the answer which you get depends on where you do matching between if, effective field theory and what scale you do matching between EFT calculation and full calculation. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, so, well, I already brought brought up this analogy with ads CFT. So it, this setup is, a, well, it is very close to what uh, what's going on there. And indeed, it's very close also to what happens in the, uh, what what's called Kerr CFT, right? So there is uh, uh, mostly hand determiner uh, with, uh, with, with friends who was studying this subject, which essentially trying to extend ads CFT to, to curve black holes. And really that's a lot more or less the same setup which has been considered 
uh, here. So let me summarize for you a couple of facts which were known there. So first of all, for extreme occur, so of course we are different situation than in equal four case. So we don't we don't have we don't know what is a quantum system which break, describes black hole, but we still can do gravity uh, calculation. And for extremal curve, one finds that uh, there is the geometry is very similar to geometry of extremal charged black hole. Namely, there is a kind of throat region, so there is a well-defined near horizon geometry. And this near horizon geometry, I think it's called warped EDS sometimes. So so it's uh, it has near horizon isometry, which, which is given by SL2R cross U1, where U1 is just azimuthal uh, symmetry, and SL2R is, uh, well, it's uh, the approximate isometry, which were uh, found by Bardin and Horowitz uh, back in 99. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of uh, what one finds for extremal curve black hole. And now for general curve, uh, so that's now really what we're talking about here. Uh, so th there, there was, th there is no near horizon region, and uh, and uh, there is no like approximate isometry. Uh, but uh, what Andy was doing, kind of here, uh, they they defined it. What's called, and I'll momentarily explain in more detail what it is. So called near zone region. And uh, they found that in, the, in this near zone region, again, I'll, I'll tell momentarily what it is, but th there are no isometri isometries, but still there are uh, symmetries, up, well, approximate symmetries, which become exact in this near zone region. Uh, the symmetries of the field equations, which are not isometries of the metric. And well, and this near zone, we'll see, there is some ambiguity in how, how one defines it. So in the way they defined, it that, uh, that the symmetries were uh, was formed SL to R cross SL to R R left and well kind of to some extent I think it was driven by the, the definition of near zone region were were driven by the desire to find this kind of symmetry because they were wanted to find kind of some that's what expected if there is some some kind of two dimensional CFT which 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 describes black hole so that 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 was uh, the thinking uh, however that symmetry which they had it wasn't also it wasn't a uh, globally defined symmetry it was a local symmetry but it, it didn't uh, didn't have didn't respect periodicity and the phi goes to phi plus two pi where phi is a uh, azimuthal angle so it didn't allow to go to map kind of global solutions of uh, equations into other global solutions of equations. So what we'll see is that there is a different definition of near zone symmetry, which actually allows uh, allows to construct global symmetry. So that's that will be the main part of the story. Uh, but let me, uh, before doing that, let me explain now what this near zone is about. Uh, so what one is doing, so now can we're doing this microscopic calculation to, to find uh, these uh, lab numbers, which corresponds just so we're trying to solve uh, equation for field five for scalar field in the curve background, and one can separate variables. So uh, uh, famously, in curve background, the uh, one can separate uh, uh, one can still separate uh, variables uh, between the uh, theta angle and tr and phi, and this these solutions can be looked in the form radial function times e to minus omega t plus I am phi, uh, where well, this phi is different from, yeah, I have three different files on this slide, but hopefully there is no confusion. So this is scalar field and this phi is azimuthal angle. So they're, they're different guys. Uh, and uh, then uh, for this uh, radial function R, uh, one finds uh, equation of the following kind. One finds equation dr delta dr r plus uh, vr equal to l l plus one r so here delta is this function which appears in the curve metric i'm working in uh boiling with coordinates so r, r plus r minus r plus times r, r minus r minus where r plus and r minus two horizons of the black hole 
Uh, so L is a quantum number which comes from solving the angular equation for this angular equation which uh, for, for this function S. So for Schwarzschild they call L is just usual uh, uh, angular momentum is in integer, but for curve black hole in general, L is not an integer number. So it also depends on frequency, but I'll use the same letter. Uh, uh, and this potential V, well, let me write it schematically. That's probably will be the longest equation which I will write in my talk, but it's something like that. It's 2M R plus squared omega minus omega m squared over delta uh, minus 2m r plus squared for omega omega m r minus r minus uh, r plus minus r minus plus well there is a bunch of terms to m omega a m plus four squared omega squared plus squared beta. Yeah, my problem with curve matrix is that no matter how hard I try, still I end up introducing infinite number of letters to, to define its parameters. Uh, but here m is a black hole mass, a is a spin, uh, uh, the uh, beta, actually it's a very bad notation, it's Hawking temperature, but well, anyway, so there, 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 this, is, this is the full potential. What's important that there, there is this term, this very first term, uh, which is singular at, as R goes to R plus so because of this one over delta there. So singular R going uh, to R plus. Uh, all these other terms are regular. Uh, and moreover, all these other terms also they're suppressed by frequency. So they all vanish at, at low frequency. And so the idea of this near zone expansion is the following. It, it goes back to the paper by Starobinsky from 1973 or something. So one divides this, this, poten this full potential into two pieces, V equal to V0 plus epsilon V1, where epsilon is a formal parameter of this near zone expansion, formal parameter, which for actual curve metric, it's really, it will be set to one eventually, uh, but you don't need to have a small parameter to, to do an expansion. It's kind of, it's a question of radius of convergence, how, how good the expansion is, but the, uh, uh, but the, the requirements for this separation so that this V0 part, it should uh, contain all singular terms, all singular terms. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that means that V1 has a property that, uh, so this expansion, if when one works at leading order in near zone expansion, so that's epsilon equal to one, that's a full answer, but leading order in near zone, that corresponds to epsilon equal to zero. Uh, but in particular, that produces, uh, uh, so if this condition is satisfied, uh, then it produces uh, accurate results as soon as omega r is much smaller than one and omega m is much smaller than one. So it produces accurate results at small frequencies. So in particular, if I'm interested in static quantities like love numbers, then it's, it's exact. So uh, because all terms which are being dropped, they're suppressed by omega. Uh, but also, in, so this near zone approximation, it's covers on one hand side, it covers vicinity of black hole, but also it covers the part of the asymptotically flat region. Because as soon as omega r is much smaller than one, uh, this approximation is, is accurate. So R can be much larger than M in particular. So it, it, it covers the region far, far away from, from black hole. Uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, there is some ambiguity. So it's 
kind of this near zone expansion, it's because becomes accurate in the low frequency limit, but it's not the same as near frequency limit because even at the leading order in near zone expansion in this V0, one keeps some frequency dependent terms. So in particular here, we see there is frequency dependent terms. Uh, so, and there are different possible definitions of, uh, uh, of uh, near zone expansion. So for instance, the one which was used to start by Starabinsky is just to keep this very first term, uh, the one in, uh, which I, I showed here. Uh, and actually probably that's the best one. Uh, but uh, it, it's for, for my for my purpose here. It will it's it, ha it has some very very nice pro pro properties, but it's not the fastest one to derive what I, what I want to get. But actually, one may use that one, and so probably that's the best one. Uh, anyway, Strominger used some some different expansion and di different uh, near zone uh, 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 expansion, but a different in the following sense. So one can move some terms from V1, some frequency dependent term V1, one can pull some of, and that still preserves all the properties which one wants. So, uh, and uh, Strominger moved some of the terms from here into V0, and that's how uh, uh, he arrived to this SL2R cross SL, SL2R. Uh, instead, what we will do, again, we I could have been using Starabinsky, but it will be a bit more complicated. So to get, Geodesically to what I want, I will keep Starabinsky and I will keep this uh, other, this other term which is present here. So my V0, what I will call V0, will be the sum of these two, two terms. Uh, and so, kind of what one now tries to do, one tries to do expansion in this formal parameter epsilon, where epsilon is whatever multiplies this, these remaining terms. And as I said, well, it may or may not work for finite frequencies, but it's expansion which at small frequencies, it guaranteed to produce accurate answers. And at zero frequency, it uh, produces exact answers. And that's if we're interested in static love numbers, then that's 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 all we, what we want. Sege? Yes. Uh, so is there an analog of tortoise coordinates for care? Yeah, yeah, sure. One can, can go, yeah. There is and one can go change of variables. There is a very direct analog of tortoise coordinates, yes. So then uh, I guess what I remember was that in tortoise coordinates, this effective potential just becomes zero as I go close to horizon or, or I, I misremember. Yeah, that's, that's true. Are, yeah. And then there is some bump. Uh, so, right. So is this near zone just the uh, left, uh, the between the- No, 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 that's what I, no, no, that's what I was trying to say here. Right, because you see, the near zone is defined by these two conditions. So, in so particular, it goes beyond that, if I say right, it's, it's, exactly, at small frequency, it in, it covers this whole bump. It goes to R much larger than the size of the black hole. So it overlaps uh, with with asymptotically flat part also, and that's why it's useful for calculations like that, where you want to do matching between something which close. It covers the near horizon region, but it goes way 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 further out right out. okay now the reason for this particular choice which we made here is the following so uh, that uh, it turns out that with, with this choice well, this, it's a kind of it's a version of what Strummager had but uh, I think better version at least for these purposes uh, so one can define the, define the following three vector fields let me call L0 minus beta minus one dt, where this beta is the same beta which appeared here. So as I said, it's, it's Hawking temperature of the black hole at the end of the day. And L plus minus equal to E plus minus uh, beta t minus plus delta one half dr plus, plus beta minus one dr delta one half dt plus a over delta to one half d phi. So one may define these three vector fields. So my, one may first check that first these are like they're obviously are globally well-defined. They have all the correct periodicities. So Strummager has some very similar vector fields, but it involved also some phi dependence, which wasn't uh, uh, respecting phi periodicity. Also one can check that these vector fields are regular at both advanced 
and well, black hole and white hole horizon. So they're really uh, re regular vector fields. So they're not the isometries, but they're symmetries of their uh, near zone equation in the following sense. So they're in the near near zone equation, near zone equation takes takes form C2 phi equal to L L plus one phi, where well, I forgot to say it, so one can also calculate commutation relation between this uh, these vector fields and they form SL2R algebra. So uh, it's, it's again SL2R uh, and the uh, near zone equation can, is, is just written as a uh, eigenvalue equation for the C2 is a quadratic Casimir of that, uh, of that SL2R. Uh, and uh, basically, well, that, from that fact, we'll see now all, 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 the, all the rest is followed. So let, 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 let's, let's now all kind of all, all properties of love numbers now can be understood in terms of uh, just uh, representation theory of, 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 of this SL2R. Uh, and uh, right. But imp so importantly, because these fields are well defined, globally well defined, then really they map solutions into solutions. So let's start with the case of Schwarzschild black, black holes in four dimensions. So d equal four, a equal to zero. Uh, so in this case, uh, this L is really is the usual L. L L is an integer. Is integer. Uh, well, which suggests so, so 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 from what I said before, it follows that solutions of these near zone equations they belong to representations of this sl 2 R. Uh, and these are some non-unitary representations, but uh, from when L is an integer, it suggests that actually that will be a uh, uh, finite dimensional representation corresponding to kind of weak rotation of usual SO3 representations, because SL2R is a weak rotation of SO3. Uh, and actually that's exactly what, what happens here, uh, but and the way to see it, so one finds, uh, so first one solves equation like, like, like one looks for a uh, highest weight vector. One looks for the solution which annihilated by L plus with the weight oops, uh, uh, given equal to L and the solution is uh, e to the L beta T delta to, to L, L, L over two. And one may explicitly check that this solution is regular both in the future and the past horizons. On a priori, that's not guaranteed uh, from the form of the regularity of, of the vector fields, but here one may just check that this solution is indeed this highest weight uh, uh, vector uh, is, is regular. Then as usual, one may construct a cell to our representations acting by uh, L minus uh, on, on this, on this uh, highest weight vector. And in particular, uh, if one acts uh, so if one defines one acts L times, if one act uh, L times V, that becomes a regular static solution. So that was the choice. The reason I choose this particular value for highest weight is because, well, it was seen in the form of this vector field that acting by L minus, you decrease the frequency by beta and the weight is exactly that corresponds to frequency. So starting with this uh, uh, highest weight vector, I get uh, I, I get regular static solution, which is only possible be because L is an integer number. A uh, question, question? Yes. So, so in this problem, <coughs> for, uh, for this highest weight, it's not uh, a solution of the original uh, wave equation, right? It's because you already dropped some terms in the V1. Yeah, so this is a solution of near zone, near, near, near zone equation, right? But it has high frequency, so it's not uh, a good approximation of the near zone uh, equation. Right, yeah, so th that's exactly, that's related to the confusions which I wanted to discuss oh. at the very end. So yeah, yeah. yeah that's, 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 that's an excellent point. Yeah, it's, not, it's not approximately good solution of the full, of the full equation. Right. However, however, the static solution which I get from it it's exact solution of, of the full equation. Yeah, I understand. But, and, but, and but the regularity condition you impose on the highest weight 
solution. But why you impose regularity conditions? Like if it's not, it's a solution of like a different problem. Who knows whether no, it has singularity at the black hole? I don't know because that, no, because that guarantees for me that the static solution is, is, is regular because the static solution is obtained by acting with L minus on the on this highest weight solution uh -huh. and L minus is a regular vector field. So ah, given the okay. highest weight solution so, is regular, so I'm guaranteed to work. I see. So you want like because those uh, those L generators are regular to the horizon. So you want to like form some representation that uh, eventually, eventually it's smooth uh, for the static solution, then it automatically imposes the uh, regularity condition. Right. Yeah. Exactly. How right. about at the infinity? It, you need yeah, both that's... regular at the horizon and infinity, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's also regular. It's yeah, also... Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, no. Sorry. At infinity, well, actually, I don't know it, because remember, for the purpose of finding love numbers, we are not interested in regular solutions at infinity. No, sorry, I, I said that wrong. Because for the purpose of finding love numbers, we only impose regularity at the horizon, and then we look at the asymptotics of the infinity, and the love number is the ratio between growing and decaying p p there. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, mm -hmm. so, so you infinity, just need we, to impose the smoothness at the horizon. Right, that's and it, that un, that, uh -huh. that uniquely fixes the static solution. Right. You, yes. you said that something that it's regular on both future and past horizon. What? Why? Yeah, past and horizon plays. Uh, no, it doesn't actually. For curve black hole, it happens. There is similar story, but it only regular at the future horizon. So yeah, it's really we only care about regularity at the future horizon because kind of physical black holes formed by result of collapse only have have. have Future, future horizon. Uh, Sorry, okay. Can I, can I, can I, everyone else is ahead of me, I think. So what are we computing right now? So we have this world line, um, which has no substructure in it by itself, but then it was going to couple to the field phi, which was your proxy for the graviton, correct? Well, now we forget, we, we already kind of forget it. We're doing really now microscopic calculation, right? So we're just look at the- Okay, that's what, that's what was, that, that, that was what was confusing me. We seem to be do, indeed doing a microscopic calculation. So. In other words, you're now talking about a probe that's not this <clears throat> point-like object, but is a field, and you're looking at solutions. Right, because I, I'm doing microscopic calculation, which will determine for me uh, these coefficients on the world line effective theory. How, okay, so, how, okay, 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 okay. So you're gonna go, okay. So you're going from the top down in that sense. Um, right. Yeah. So I'm right. doing. I'm kind of repeating the calculations which people do to rep to get these zero love numbers. But I'm trying to see to find there's a structure which which produces zero. So I, I'm trying to see what what is the microscopic theory, what is algebraic structure which gives which produces zero love number. Okay, because because you couldn't just you couldn't just take the world line thing and somehow apply these l plus minus and l zero to that. No, 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 no. Those, right, and just show is, those you couldn't do that, right? Or could you? Yeah, no, no. Of course, because the world line describes any low effective theory. No, we don't yeah, really. Yeah. Theory in the calculation microscopic theory to deduce for black holes what what are their what the, what the, these Wilson coefficients are. Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, and just one more question before I stop. So, the consequence of them vanishing is then that the ultimately after you go through this correct route of showing it from the top down, the the world line theory then has none of these k terms, right? So. It, it's all, it's action is just the naive one. So it's as if, even if it has some substructure, it doesn't, it propagates along a, a point like geodesic. Is that, is that the upshot of this? It seems like a really strong statement, but. Um... Well, it's, first of all, it's only about static, static terms, right? Uh, right. So it's, yeah, the statement that you did in a static background, it propagates along, it doesn't feel the field, the presence of the field phi. Right? It, it, just does, it just doesn't feel the presence of the kind of gradients in the metric, even if it's an extended object. <laughs> uh, right. Which is, which is, yeah. a really, which is a really uh, strong statement, it sounds like. Um, I, I'm tempted to try and connect it to, since, especially since you opened the door to ADS CFT, which <laughs> um, isn't really relevant directly here, but. You know, there are these calculations of, say, extended strings and backgrounds of black holes like Donaldson and Oguri have these calculations where there's definitely a tidal effect that builds up for at least for some trajectories. 
um, there in, in a rather dramatic way. So um, yeah, I'm just kind of groping for how to how these things are all consistent. But I guess you're saying, first, first of all, that example was an ADS and so on. So maybe it doesn't even apply. Maybe. No, but also if it's if it's trained, then it will be kind of, because there are some kind of tidal effects just because string string is now one dimensional object. Like there are tidal effects. Well, no, no, no. But that, the, the whole thing about this effective theory is saying, yeah, but you could have described you could describe all that to some infinite se sequence of terms, right? And you're saying those terms are zero. No matter what, the microscope. So they're only zero for Schwarzschild black hole, right? Say for neutron star, they all, they will all be on zero. But by, by only for new, Schwarzschild black hole, you mean as the probe or as the source? <laughs> as the probe. As the probe, okay. The right. Stream will get yeah. anything that probe, I guess, will get uh, either the. Okay, good. good. Okay, okay. So it's for it's for the it's not the source. It's the it's the probe. That that's the part that I was missing. I guess. Yeah. Okay. He, 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 yeah. He got. Uh, sorry, Sergey and Eva. Can I make a comment? I mean, there are some interesting calculations back in the the nineties, and I think a little bit later than that as well, by various people, um, talking about um, the electric and magnetic dipole moments of. Uh, comparing extremal black holes and near extremal black holes to excited string states. And there were some puzzles there. You know, sometimes they match um, exactly, but, but you know, these are the very highly supersymmetric system ones. So when you're doing the extreme one, I would imagine there's a close connection between dipole moments and these love numbers. Is that correct? For the charge, for the charge black holes, for either magnetic or. Yeah, right, yeah exactly. Holes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And actually, that's what we checked. Like, that's part of what we did in our long paper. To check that also for electromagnetic responses, all static responses when all so, conservative so, static so, so, responses when so, so, so as you know, there was a claim, there's these claims that that certain classes of extremal strip, uh, sorry, uh, excited string states match on to, to black hole states in their properties. And and it was done for these dipole moments. So is the claim going to be that in fact for certain kinds of string states, there is also this um, um, SL2R like symmetry? Probably well to the extent that they reproduce, uh, yeah, these vanishing things. Yeah, it, it, I think this is L two R is really related to her, to the presence of the horizon. Yeah, to the extent uh, that these these things respond to black holes. Yeah, I would say so. Right. But, yeah, that, that's quite interesting. If if you can yeah. say something on the string side. So you you've explicitly checked that these all these statements do apply for all the the dipole quantities. You say it's in one of your. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's an hour. Yeah. yeah, for for okay. black holes, it's yeah all static like electromagnetic responses also vanish, right? Okay, very interesting. Yeah, uh, but so yeah, let me so so get get to the bottom line here. So so one I get, one can construct this regular static solution, but then one can act back on this solution by L plus. And we know by construction, we know that L plus to the power L plus one acting this static solution gives zero because we started from highest highest weight vector to get, get this solution. But then just by explicitly uh, inspecting how L plus acts on, on the static function on psi to the R from the explicit form of this L plus, one finds, well, there will be some prefactor, some e to the l plus one, beta, oops, beta d, some extra like delta l plus one over two times dr l plus one psi of r. Uh, so basically the statement is, so, and that's exactly what, so the fact that it vanishes tells us that this psi of r should have been polynomial, polynomial in r, and that's exactly the statement that there is no this one over r to the l plus one piece. That's exactly the statement that there is there is no there is no tidal response. So in other words, we see that this vanishing of the uh, uh, of the tidal response is directly linked to the it actually not to the finiteness of the representation, but to the fact that this representation of a siltoir is highest weight representation. That by acting with uh, uh, the raising operator a number of times, you get zero. And that's 
that, that, that gives a, a polynomial. So I, yeah, I'm running out of time. Let me just briefly say what happens in other cases. So for instance, for curved black hole, uh, what happens there is very similar story. So there actually one doesn't get finite dimensional representation, but one still gets highest weight representation and highest weight property in the same way translates uh, into, into the vanishing of the, of the lab numbers. And uh, really testing ground that it's all kind of, that's the right interpretation of the story is this situation with Schwarzschild black, black hole at D, D larger than four, or D larger than four A equal to zero. So there is, a, there is a very similar story. There is a kind of generalization of this SL2R, which can be found. And the equation takes this form. So let me call it L hat, L hat plus one. So there is some kind of analog of this pa parameter L, uh, but this L hat, it has the form L hat is equal to L divided by D minus three, where L is now in, in integer, is an integer number and D is a number of space-time dimensions. So what happens is that, uh, so when L hat is integer, I can run the same story and guess again, uh, highest, highest weight property for the corresponding representation. And that's when L hat is integer, that corresponds to these are those special cases when love numbers were found uh, to vanish in these calculations which people were doing. So the kind of the claim is really that this vanish of land numbers it's linked to the uh, to the highest weight property of the uh, of the corresponding representation. Now for generic L hat, uh, this is not in the it's not not integer, so love numbers don't vanish. However, the presence of the symmetry now explains explains the absence of the running because so we have two solutions at that value of L hat, and these solutions are different representations of SL two R. So that means there is a local way to, to tell apart which one is regular and which one is singular. So there is an algebraic criterion to distinguish the two solutions. They, they cannot mix with each other. And that's why there, no running happens. On the other hand, when L hat is half integer, then it happens that the two solutions, regular and singular solutions, they correspond to two isomorphic representations of SL2R. And that's why it's when, it's when, when running arises. So I think the analogy is a good analogy. Is like uh, we're used to the fact that running is a generic property for a quantum field theory, but actually it's not the case. So when you do conformal perturbation theory, running is pretty exceptional property. You need to, to, some certain resonance condition to be satisfied for, uh, for, for different operators to be able to mix. And that's, so this situation when the two uh, representations which are gene gene degenerate with each other, they uh, algebraically the same, that's analog of that kind of resonance condition which, which is required for running. And that exactly that happens when uh, L half is half integer. Uh, and so for, for generic L hat, uh, so it's not integer. So the, the static solution don't belong to uh, highest weight representation, but still the presence of the symmetry explains why there is no running because they're algebraically different, they cannot uh, cannot uh, mi mix to mix to each other. Uh, yeah. So, well, as I said, there are some natural good things which happen in Strabinsky's story, but yeah, I don't have time to that. Let me just say one one last thing, and that's re related to the question which I think uh, Jen Bin asked. Uh, so, at first sight, it looks like okay, we got some triumph of naturalness. So we uh, we we were interested in the static quantity and we found that this system which we're studying has kind of approximate symmetry at low frequencies and that symmetry at the algebraic level explains vanishing uh, of certain Wilson coefficients. It kind of it re reformulates everything in terms of like certain algebraic statement that certain representations have uh, uh, high, highest weight property. However, the confusion is that uh, kind of that symmetry, if you, well, that's exactly what the point made by Jen Bean. Uh, so where, where do I have this generators written? Yeah. So if you look at this symmetry, is the generators of my symmetry, then because of this e to the beta t factors, they actually, they mix UV and IR modes. So on one hand side, this is a approximate symmetry present only into low, low frequency, uh, in low frequency approximation, but the way it acts, it, even if I start start with static mode, it, it takes it to, into mode with high image, uh, imaginary frequency because there is 
this it was a beta t exponent here, and beta is really the scale of the cutoff of my effective field theory. Uh, so in that sense, it looks it doesn't look like a conventional kind of symmetry explanation. Uh, it doesn't invalidate any of the arguments which I made because uh, kind of the procedure was here really first take near zone approximation, and this near this near zone approximation produces exact answers for st static quantities. And then in this near zone approximation, there is a very nice algebraic uh, reason for love numbers to vanish. However, if one now recalls, if one really tries to think about this near zone approximation as some kind of low energy effective theory, then this symmetry, which is responsible for these constellations, it really takes IR modes into UV modes. So one takes one out of their uh, regime when uh, kind of this near zone approximation was accurate. Uh, yeah. So, and that's, as I said, yeah. Could you explain again why? The, is it obvious that all regular static solutions can be generated, like should be descendants uh, of, you know, regular uh, solutions? Like, can I imagine a situation where uh, some, I start with, you know, some highest weight thing that is not, you know, not regular at the horizon, but then I, you know, act by enough of this low, whatever lowering or uh, raising operators and then I get a static solution that is uh, regular in the horizon. Like, like well, how do you know that you didn't miss some, some, some static, some regular static solution? That I didn't miss, you, you mean in what, what, what case you have in mind now? You have in mind, well, it just even like go back to like D equal for Schwarzschild or you know some some simple thing. So you say okay, all so just from the no, in, in, in like D equal for Schwarzschild, I just obtained explicitly obtained all static solutions. Can be I, I showed they all has highest weight property. Now for D larger than four, when yeah, I thought you maybe I missed it, but I thought you started with so some highest weight solution. They were time dependent, and then you acted on them with a bunch of lowering operators and then you obtain the static solution no it, it, it wasn't right that. yeah but but that, that that showed that those static solutions they belong to highest weight representation but also for highest weight representation to exist well it, it, you need to like this l parameter well it it, 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 it should have right property so basically in higher dimensions when l hat is not is not integer we just know that there are no highest weight representations with 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 all, with, all, with non integer l hat and having static solution having solution at level zero, right? So, so so there we know right right away algebraically know that these uh, solutions don't belong to highest weight representation, and in four dimensions, yeah, we just found that all static solutions. They, 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 they belong to highest weight representation. I guess Victor was asking a conceptual question. Imagine you didn't uh, like check uh, all the solution explicitly, just to realize that uh, you have this equation and uh, you have this SL2R representation, but bring you to uh, like a different physical system. Then like, uh, how do you, uh, is the argument to make sure that uh, all the regular solutions in the, all the regular static solutions have to belong to the, uh, uh, belong to the highest weight. Uh, representations. Uh, are you missing something yeah. that isn't in the representation, but also a solution for the static? Uh, uh, it's also a static solution. But of course, you check it explicitly, then, then you, you know for sure. But imagine if someone didn't want to check it, like is there a quick argument for them to uh, to convince, like convince us, like uh, other solutions are, other static solutions are beyond to the highest weight representation. Well, yeah, I'm not sure I fully understood what the question is. Is it, is it easy? Like, how, how do you know, like, how are you sure that you found all the static solutions? I guess maybe, uh, again, that's what I'm asking. So you say, well, don't you have one a teacher, L there is a one solution for any L, right? So there is single st static solution for any L, right? So, okay. Oh, no, maybe that's, sorry, that's the simple answer to my question. If you right. know that yeah. there is a unique solution for any L, 
regulate the horizon. So there are, uh, for, any, for any else, there are two solutions, singulate the horizon and regulate the good, horizon. Good, good. Okay, that's what I was so asking. The, you found a way to construct a regular solution for any L, and that's good enough. Right, right. That's yes. That's my question, yeah. Yeah, because this whole question is about you start with a reg regularity condition at the horizon, and then that uniquely that fixes so solution. You then you look at infinity and ask yourself whether there is decaying tail in that in that solution. And if there is a decaying tail, that corresponds to non-vanishing love number. And the absence of decaying tail that exactly cor that that corresponds to the highest weight property because that essentially tells that the solution is polynomial. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just still way behind on what it is you're computing exactly. There's some field equation that you're working with here, right? Yeah, there is a Klein-Gordon equation for scalar field. Scalar field. field, okay. In, cur in curve diagram. Let, let, let me ask, let me ask, sorry. Um, yeah. So there, there's this field equation for the Klein, for the scalar field. Um, now the setup is supposed to be two black holes. In particular, the probe is supposed to be a black hole, right? No, um, I'm looking now so, at one black. No, I'm looking at just at one black hole. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to the, the, the problem is that you guys were saying the love number vanishes in the case, specific case that the top-down theory is a black hole probing whatever is probing. I thought some other black hole, right? No, black black hole is probed by a scalar field. Uh, yeah, well, that's no, what you were confusing me before. So I thought that's okay. Okay, sorry. So I, I'm just way behind. I should so, look. So at, love, love, love number is a characteristic really of a single black hole. The love number, it's a, it's a some Wilson coefficient in the world line theory of a, of a single oh, black okay. hole. The probe is the scalar field. The probe is not a black hole. Right. Okay, you guys, before I thought, were telling me the probe was the black hole. So I was here looking for how the scalar field calculation told you how it, you know, a probe black hole would, would, um, you know, yeah. I think it's a bit confusing what you call a probe, but the experiment that's being done, there is a single black hole and somebody scatters I know that's what I thought, but, but so, I, so, I, so, I, so, I, so I, yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay, good, good. But, but, uh, okay, but as such, this is a probe, which is, you know, neither a, a black hole nor a string, it's just some, some other probe whose love, love number vanishes. Is that, is that the way to talk about this? Who's, who's, um, whose you know propagation given what you were saying about this world line action whose propagation would not be affected by tidal forces at least at this at the level of the terms you're talking about here i mean so so anyways it's, it's, it's a different top-down theory from the black hole case so, so say it again what, what's your well, look, look, look i'm trying to understand if this has implications for how what kinds of probes of black holes <laughs> does this have implications for probes of black holes well, for any probe of black hole, right? Because oh, okay, okay, okay. So then before I was asking, okay, but there were these calculations of strings propagating where they really did feel the tidal forces and you and certainly stars feel them and so on. So not all probes of black holes do not feel tidal forces. I, I'm sorry, I'm just super confused about the very basic no, logic. Your probe no, of black holes with some simple, okay, I think examples of probes of black hole, I know, scalar field, electromagnetic field, gravitational field, but it's but something that's... You, you always work to linear order in uh, in in that thing that you're sending uh, onto a black hole, so you're not trying internal structure of particles that you're scattering off the black hole. But but, but let's see. But tidal. This is about tidal forces, right? Tidal forces have to do with little gradients and your sensitivity to them, right? That that's what we're. That's the general question here. Um, yeah, tidal force the tidal force itself it's, gets deformed. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, <laughs> okay. Okay, so the black hole, you're asking whether the black hole itself gets deformed by the scalar field that's propagating in this background? Is that the... Well, it's rather I'm looking at the black hole propagating in some non-trivial background created by some source which is very, very far away. And I'm asking whether the black hole gets deformed due to this external, the presence of this external background. Yeah. So when, when the, in the equation you said black hole back reactive, you just look at the scalar wave equation. Why is the back, Here, black hole back reactive? Right, so you look at the scalar wave equation. It, exactly, it's just, what you actually do here is a scalar wave. <laughs> so, so, sorry, uh, you, you have been cut off. Uh, but yeah, so this is R. So I look at the equation, it's a solution for scalar field equation of the forms that it's, so here is the horizon, it's regular at the horizon. And then I'm looking at the solution which grows at infinity, like 
r to the l and the presence of this growth that corresponds to the fact that there is a source which sits far away from the black hole and then so this, is a, so that's right. this is a solution for the scalar field phi right so i'm looking at the solution for scalar field phi which where i fix the fact that it, the solution grows at infinity regulate the horizon and mm -hmm. i'm trying to see where what is the kind of decaying piece here r minus l minus one times k and the coefficient in front of this decaying piece that's the response that's has an interpretation and it's really in the effect if t calculations that's literally how one defines determines this wilson coefficients so this coefficient it it has information about black hole being deformed by this external field and producing this, this response in additional to initial one of our piece, one, one of our, our potential. So the technical calculation is, is, that, is really this one. So you look at the Klein-Gordon equation, you impose regularity here, you fix growing part at the, at the infinity and you look at the decaying part at infinity. And that decaying part, that's, that's, the, that's the response. The response of, of, of what to what? The response of... It's a response of a black hole uh -huh. to, the, to the external field but, but, created but, by... But, some... but sorry, you're solving for the field. So this decaying piece is, is in the solution for the field, not the gravitational field of the black hole. Or you, well, if there, if there were, if there were no black hole... Sorry, sorry, you're associating that with the black hole now. That, that's how I'm supposed to think right, about yeah. it. Because if, if there were no black hole, then... I would just have like R to the L, right? I would have just growing piece coming from 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 uh, well, from the for growing piece for, for the, sec the the second object is the phi, the field phi. The first object was the black hole. So but the the second object is kind of is really at infinity. Sits in infinity here. It's imaginary object which creates this this growing growing piece for 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 the field phi. Yeah, but you may yeah so. The picture is that there is a. I'm sorry, sorry, I think maybe the thing I'm missing, and I'm sorry I'm being super slow today, but the 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 field phi is supposed to be a proxy for the gravitational field, or is it a proxy for the. Yeah, so, yeah, I should say there is exactly the same. No, it, here it's, well, it's a scalar field, but there is exactly the same calculation which can be done for gravitational field. And, okay, and so, story, so it's, it's a proxy. The story is exactly the same. Okay, okay, so, so it's a proxy for the gravitational field, and there really are two black holes in this problem. Well, there is one black hole, and then some other source. It doesn't matter what it is. There is some other source far away, which mm -hmm. creates gravitational field here, which locally we can just tailor expand. And it looks like there is some R to the L, some, some part which grow, grows towards, towards the direction of that, that object far away. And it doesn't matter what, what that object is. Okay, 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 I see, I see. So you're, say, you're saying this, this downward line would be um, the development of some response of the black hole to, to the other object with with the scalar field being representing the the gravitational field of the other object, right? And we're including its gradients and everything else. Okay, okay, thank you. I'm I'm sorry, I was so slow. <laughs> sorry, Sergey, I have a naive question. So, if you in, interpret this uh, decaying piece as the response of the black hole, uh, shouldn't it be suppressed by one over n, uh, suppressed by G Newton? But this does not suppress by G Newton. If it's a back reaction, gravitational back reaction. It's white. more like a particle, this five field is self interacting on this curved background that will give you this response. Yeah, because I think, I think you said it in the beginning with your planet example, you kind of postulated that this uh, downward going pieces is physically related to the fact that Earth was deforming, right? But maybe it's not. Like it's not obvious. Uh, not obvious. Why is, to us, case? Yeah. Like why is it enough to just solve the linearized equation uh, in the background of Schwarzschild? Like it looks like Schwarzschild never got deformed itself, right? You you can Schwarzschild and you solve some linearized equation. Like why does it? Why oh, because I... in this equation corresponds to deforming of the the shape of an object? I, I think that that's. Well, not. because I'm I'm doing linear response calculation, right? So, you know, yeah, that corresponds to solving. I'm, I'm solving linear. So, yeah, so, so again, how else would we define the deformation? 
Right. If not by that one of the R to the L piece. But really, I think that's why, well, this if T, if T definition is kind of, it, I think it allows to avoid all, all, all these confusions, right? So there is some exact solution for this linear equation and we just trying to reproduce the solution by doing if T calculation where we introduce this uh, coefficients on, on the, on the, uh, on the word line and there, well, yeah, well, here it's clear because we're looking at the piece that is quadratic in the action for phi, which corresponds right. to solving linear equation for phi. So, so in this right. relation, I think it is. It is. Yeah, but so, but in this language, exactly. So, if they have, if all k's are equal to zero, then you just solve in. So then phi doesn't know that the black hole is there, and you have just if you said if you put source somewhere far away, you will find just only a contribution growing towards the source. You find r r to the l. In, in the in the FT language. Now, if if there are this this kind of quadratic terms on the word line, then you have uh, in the presence of non-zero phi. Now you have additional contribution in the equation, uh, kind of localized kind of localized on the word line, and so you start getting also decay decaying parts. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly that's the matching calculation you are doing. Yeah, the calculation you are doing is clear. So, like I think clear, but. Let's say if I take G Newton goes to zero. So it's like, is any of your calculation changed? Uh, it feels me nothing changed. So but then, the case, do this case depend on G Newton? Like it's not right, like, yeah, because it's essentially. I thought the black hole becomes zero. Take G Newton goes to zero. I mean, the, the Schwarzschild was. Through. Well, because this case, they're for the. Uh, sh sh size of the black hole, right? Or for the or for the rest, like that's that, that's the parameter. Uh, okay. So, but the, but the, but uh, also so. also the form of the generators L plus I minus degenerates itself if you take G Newton to zero. Well, it depends on kind of yeah. What exactly you mean by taking G Newton to zero? Do you, do you want to keep geometry fixed or? Yeah, the geometry fixed, like scale M, and take G Newton to zero. I think Jambian wants to make black hole very rigid, just for, yes, yeah, so it's a yeah. background that you cannot deform no matter how much energy you send at it. But, but I think probably in the, yeah, because in this case, G Newton is something like, because I, this field bulk hill phi, it has bulk kinetic term, right? D, D phi squared. So by G Newton, you mean something the, the, what stands in, in front of here, right? It, One of a genuine, right? So you, 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 so in that sense, if if everything is right, so uh, if you, yeah, so if if you have something like this, if you, so this is bulk part of the action, and then if you here you have k, oops, k d phi squared on the word line, yeah, if you take this. G Newton to zero, keeping this K fixed, then the, 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 effect, the, the, the effect goes to zero, but. Uh... So essentially kind of what I call love now is that this this quantity is already in units of this of this G Newton, right? I, 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 so okay, I, I don't I don't think that that's a particularly convincing argument for the scalar case. I mean, maybe for the gravity, if we're asking about the deformation properties of the black hole itself. Uh, you, you you have to you have to allow you you want to take a you want to take some limit um well i'm not sure yeah well we're solving full in the case of black hole yeah so it all comes from in the microscopic theory it all all comes from einstein action right so mm -hmm. so in, in that sense well you're solving 
you first found you found, found this black hole matrix solving Einstein's theory, and now you look at small perturbations around this metric and determine this response. So it's, in that sense, genuine, there is no way to send well, separately. But, but, but the thing, but we know what happens in that case, which is R plus and R minus both go to zero. Well, if you take that limit, well, yeah, yeah then. Yeah. But that's why I said, it's, isn't the correct statement that the G Newton, G Newton appears, because if you go back to the way the generators are defined, all right, in fact, because R plus and R minus are going to zero, right? They're, they're, the actual form of the generators is, is becoming singular. But, uh, but, but I think Jen Bin was suggesting kind of to take Jen Newton to zero by but keeping R plus and R minus fixed. No, but I don't, I, that's why I disagree with. I don't think that's the appropriate limit. Well, it's a limit which one may consider, right? So, but that, and that would be like considering kind of this kind of limit when, Well, I, so I agree that, you know, of course, it's... Yeah. Well, I think really the statement that kind of the natural quantity to talk about is kind of this love number in units of this G Newton, which, which appear, appear here. So there is kind of some, some natural scaling of these love numbers with the mass of the black hole. It's also a bit because you're doing, I mean, Amplitude of field phi doesn't matter, right? Because it's all linearized. Right. And it's a question, right. okay, you, when you take G Newton to zero, but then you take phi, you can take phi bigger and bigger, right? And then black hole will eventually uh, back rate. So I think in this calculation, it just drops out because the amplitude of phi dropped out. So also G Newton dropped out, which was what matters is really the uh, ratio, right? Of energy that you send in the units of G Newton. But, uh, it's a linear calculation, so it kind of sits as, as a factor in front of everything. Yes. Okay. Can you can you explain a bit? So I mean, the status so for Kerr, the symmetry is is an isometry, right? But then for Schwarzschild, for, no, no, for for extremal Kerr, it is an isometry. That's right. For extremal okay. Kerr, it's an isometry. Then for any generic Kerr, including Schwarzschild, it's no longer an isometry, but uh, like it's a symmetry of like, why do we still care about this symmetry? Like, what is the case? Well, I think my, my we're, we're a bit confused about that. That I think it's a technical confusion, it's not conceptual, but but my picture is actually so the full symmetry which we got here, which is not isometry, it's this one. It's SL to R cross U1, which is exactly the same symmetry which one finds as a near horizon isometry for curved black hole. You so, never use you never used U1, by the way. Or U1 was just because you factorized variables and U1 was actually on theta. Yeah, you you U1 is a, like because I was using the angular number, right? M, right. But I, th I think the physical picture which I have at mind at least. So yeah, because it's natural. So there is kind of one thinks about different black holes, right? So there, there is like extremal black holes which correspond to leading edge trajectory, so to say, right? It's a states with minimal energy at given angular momentum. And so they have this symmetry SL to R cross U1. Uh, but then one goes to non-extremal case, it corresponds now to considering some, some excitation above, uh, above that, that extremal uh, state. And so that symmetry, which was present for extremal black hole, now it's spontaneously broken. So then it's natural that you find something which is not an isometry, but, but still a symmetry generating like acting on the solutions in, in the background. So um, we're trying to make that, I, I, there are several things which I'm, it is that my picture, which for me makes sense, but there are several, several confusions which I have about what I just said. But at the moment we're trying to match by kind of taking extremal limit of our non-extremal story and trying to match our SL to R cross U1 to near, near horizon. Uh, horowitz bardeen symmetry and it almost works but there are some confusions there which i think they're technical but at least that's that's the picture which i have in mind about the relation between these different things and so did you because you said you you, you mentioned the electromagnetic response but so did you look or can you look with the same technology of some charge near extremal where you know this schwartz and action comes about and uh, it also oh, we, uh, well, yeah. So there are for, yeah, there are very similar for uh, for Eisner-Nordstrom black holes. 
there are very similar. There is a generalization of these generators which one can write. There is the cell two R cross one for Lesnar Nordstrom. And that's another interesting limit to look at, to look at not in their, what happens to, the, to them, not in the extremal uh, rotating limit, but in the extremal charge limit. Yeah, that's where, what because there is some when, knowledge, right? What, I mean, there is, there is some knowledge about effective theory and also where SL2R plays a role, right? So. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. To your SL2R is extended to much larger region. Because the near near will charge near charge, charge is only the near horizon region. Here you are like for low omega, you can extend it to like uh, right. goes to infinity. Right, but that's some, somehow well at least in like in, if you look at the Andy Strominger's papers on this extremal non-extremal curve CFT, mm -hmm. so that's somehow the intuition in those papers and non-extremal black holes. One should think about them as kind of occupying this much much larger region. Uh, right, but indeed this SL2R, but, but yeah, yeah uh, the problem which we have is the following. So actually if, you, if one looks at this near horizon, uh, this near zone approximation, when one takes the extremal limit, then actually it starts breaking down also close to the horizon. Well, because kind of some of the, the, some of the terms which we dropped in this near zone approximation, they become singular when our, our, our minus go, goes to R plus. So mm -hmm, kind mm -hmm. of, so roughly what happens in the, uh, in the extremal case, uh, then this is infinity, this is uh, horizon. Uh, then there is a regime kind of close to the horizon. That's where there is near horizon isometries appear, near horizon isometries. But this near zone approximation, it doesn't work all the way towards the horizon. It works kind of in the middle. It works already in non-extremal case. It wasn't working all the way up to R to infinity. It was working up to R, MR much larger than one, but not, but omega R much smaller than one. So it works somewhere up to here. And here it's similar. It doesn't work all the way. So R, the similar condition then arises r minus r minus times omega uh, should be uh, um, I think sh sh should be uh, omega r r minus uh, r. no it's, it's well the similar but basically the, it, it, you can come very close to the horizon if omega is small but you cannot come all the way, all the way till the horizon. Don't, yeah, it's, it's yeah, because of the r minus r minus. Piece. Right, exactly. Right, well, because of the r minus, r minus piece. R, r, because r minus r minus piece. So somehow this near zone region in the extremal limit, it again it overlaps with near horizon region, region, but it somehow doesn't doesn't go all the way till the till the horizon, and that makes it a little bit tricky to 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 relate it. So that's kind of what we're trying to sort out now. But and, and for but, the but, no, yeah. but but usually you need to rescale the coordinates in, in this near human limit because neither r plus or r minus goes to zero, but uh, actually physical distance is yeah, like a long region and uh, the is that physical distance doesn't really go zero. So right, but also after the rescaling, it's uh, well, it's kind of related to that because really when you go to this near horizon region, uh, you kind of you also zoom in on frequencies. Of what are the like rotate rotation right, right. with frequency? But here, on the other hand, for the purpose of like uh, studying these love numbers, we're interested frequencies around zero from the point of view of asymptotic observer. So that somehow creates tension between these two I limits. See, I see, I see. So roughly, this near horizon region is kind of it locks in and rotates on its own. But on the other hand, we're trying to to, to look at the response at different frequencies. So that's kind of the, the tension here. But yeah, I would, but yeah, I, I, I would be very surprised if, well, if this story has, well, uh, it sounds to me that that's kind of the, I would, I'm pretty confident that algebraically that's the real reason why love numbers vanish. And it would, wouldn't make sense to me if this SL2R cross U1, which we're finding here, if it's different SL2R cross U1 from the one one finds in, in, in the extremal limit. So I think, there should be a relation between them, but it's it's a little bit subtle for for these reasons, right? 
Yeah, it would be interesting to match because sometimes people talk about this 2D, I mean, this near edges to thing. The reason that it's not exact edges too, because it never fully decouples the, uh, you know, the horizon degrees of freedom never exactly decouple in, uh, into that when you have ADS2 throat as opposed to some higher dimensional throat. So you kind of cannot very honestly take, uh, you know, a near horizon limit. So maybe this near zone limit is some well related to it because it's, it allows you to do some you know matching between near horizon well, that's, and near fully decoupled. Well, that's exactly I think that's the intuition which Framager has but also this near zone is because it's it's kind of frequency dependent right so it's the size depends on the frequency on which you're probing so somehow the intuition is that like different like excitations of black hole they kind of occupy different a different region surrounded in some sense maybe, some maybe sense. somehow in the near extremal case like uh, by proper scaling and looking at the omega like uh, not exactly zero but close to zero this sr2 is generally so you construct to become like the exact symmetry of the problem here you the theory you generated is like goes to another uh, problem right maybe by this proper scaling beta goes to very small so you are like uh, uh, the excitations are all in the low energy uh, regime. So somehow this uh, become uh, like an exact uh, <coughs> symmetry of the problem. Yeah, that's, that's roughly what, what we're what yeah what we're trying to 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 what to, 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 to check. But so far at least I'm confused. Maybe my collaborators less confused, but I'm confused about extremal limit. I see. Uh, right. Okay. But also, as I said, I'm confused in non-extremal case. Yeah, I'm confused kind of what is the right way to think about this whole story. The mm -hmm. symmetry explanation, in what category it is. It is like naturalness in the sense of thought. There is a symmetry reason for these things to vanish. Or it's more like some UV miracle because it's really this. It's a little bit like, let's say you have some symmetry, which would be like symmetry under like discrete boost invariance, right? So you don't have a small boost, but you have a large boost, which really takes you from IR well, here it's also even more complicated because it's also approximate symmetry, but leaving even that, that aside. So if you have a system where there would be symmetry, something like boost, but only with discrete value of the boost. Uh, and th that would be, uh, so then from the point of view of I low energy theory, how would we, we think about this situation? Is it something natural? If, well, the confusing uh, part is I think there, I know, would, would such a symmetry constrain low energy coefficients? Uh, low, would, would such a symmetry actually constrain coefficients of low energy effect? Well, but that's, yes, yeah, so, but yeah, let, let's say we really take our theory as this near zone approximation. So that, then leaving aside the part that there is also some approximation. So in, in that, but let's say this is our full microscopic theory. Yeah. That's exactly what happens there, right? So there is this symmetry which takes static mode into some high frequency mode, uh, but uh, certain property of static solutions is highest weight, like it's the fact that they belong to highest frequency, highest weight representation of the full symmetry explains property of the static static solution. So, so I'm already confused about this example, leaving aside extra complications that this is really approximate low frequency uh, kind of system. But even thinking about that as exact exact system is already confusing. So there is a consequence for static quantities, which follows from the symmetry, which mixes uh, uh, static and highly non-static static modes. But, but somehow this last number also controlled by the IR mode in the different sense because it controlled the running is controlled by where you put this cutoff, right? So it's uh, integrating over the region near the horizon. So in the usual ADS-CFT sense, it's uh, it's the uh, IR contribution, right? And controlled by the, this, the running is uh, in the IR direction. You're like uh, integrating out more and more IR modes, right? So so, so in this sense, it's also why it has to be to have to do with high frequencies. It's very weird. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, no, it would, it would be nice. But you're saying it's sort of obvious that there will be no 
just interesting action of the symmetry on just low energy degrees of freedom. Like you cannot write some low energy action that on its own will have some interesting action of this of this symmetry. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something. But there are some terms in the low energy effective action that cannot be supplemented by high energy terms to become invariant, right? So that's that's somehow the right. Problem. Maybe maybe a fun exercise would be like because okay, here we talk about the level of solution, but if we try to say the level of an action, like how do we know that some terms, like especially in high dimensions, right? Because you can you can have some terms that uh, that are allowed, some are not allowed, right? So then like looking at the term in the action, how do you know that it can be UV completed uh, in an invariant way, uh, you know, but but just just looking at the low end of the term itself, like how do you know, there should be some property, right? Well, for you, it will be just roughly the properties that each, you know, uh, the, if the if the number of derivative is what, uh, you know, zero mod four, zero mod d minus three, then it's it can be UV completed. And if it's not, uh, it cannot, right? I mean, but but yeah, can one say it somewhat more in a more usual symmetry way that there is some property of low energy terms that allows for a UV completion uh, and. Uh, uh, and then, so that would be maybe, I don't know if it would look like a symmetry or not, but some criteria that's formulated uniquely in the EFT, uh, you know? Uh, but maybe more more general criteria than just saying that number of derivatives is, you know, zero mod four, zero mod D minus three. Mm -hmm. Isn't this a bit like the modular bootstrap where you, can't tell just from the IR. Yeah, that's in some sense another example, right? But mm. mm -hmm. yeah, mod modular invariance has this spirit a little bit. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is also a bit like okay, it's a large Poincare trans, large Lorentz right. transformation. Right. Right. So it's kind right. of like what. Yeah, maybe 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 that gives it some common. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, but there somehow, yeah, I don't know. Like one gets some mileage out of it, some kind of extracts information about low energy quantities, but somehow at least I don't didn't see examples where it's kind of it's as striking. So here it's really just a statement, kind of canonical statement about fine tuning for some quant. There, there you just get some quantities, right? Out, out of there and uh, and it fixes is their values but but here really some wilson coefficients vanish so that's kind of what we usually yeah. call fine, fine, fine tuning right so yeah yeah no i, I agree it's sort of opposite in the sense that some at least sometimes you you predict there that you have to have a something at lower energy than such and such but here you're saying almost the well, it is it is some constraint on low energy C. It, it is, yeah. Some, is. some set of uh, dimensions, some sort of low dimensions are not allowed, yeah, because of the argument yeah, that but, kicks them yeah, into UV, right? right but but right. On, on its own, the fact that microscopic theory determines some some coefficients in low energy series, that's kind of not surprising, right? But somehow what's surprising here that also these values are so special from the point of view of theory that it just it happened to be zero, right? So uh, yeah. that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Having no response is very, very, very curious as has been said all, all along. So when it comes to the non-static response, that would be something like exciting a quasi-normal mode or whatever for the, the black hole on the left of your picture. And that is, and that is not constrained, is that correct? Well, First of all, well, because there are different, yeah, yeah. So that's something that I didn't say. But what happens is Strabinsky in your zone approximation. So that actually in Strabinsky in your zone approximation, all time-dependent love numbers also vanish. So there, it's kind of it's not a property of the full system, 
but if you in that near zone approximation, one finds that uh, there is no also no time dependent love, love So it's really at the level of conservative response, kind of that system looks like. Point part. So the time dependent ones, they're not as well defined because they kind of depend on the definition of near zone approximation. Is that the status? Well, right, because in the near zone only calculates, produces exact answers for, for static ones. And for actual black hole in Einstein theory, the, uh, the time dependent ones are non zero. But somehow, if one takes, if one Take the Strabinsky near zone approximation uh, that in the leading order in Strabinsky near zone approximation, uh, somehow all, all responses vanish. So, uh, yeah, which suggests that somehow that, that, that near zone may be in some sense really mostly characterized system itself rather than uh, kind of uh, it's how it's embedded into. So what is there hope that this survives at a nonlinear level? Say we do, I mean, we try to construct some theory that also contains some, you know, phi to the four terms or whatever. Uh, you know, in principle, there is, right? You can go to nonlinear uh, response or something. Like, could, do you think this symmetry has a chance of surviving or it's really a symmetry of Linearized. I mean, if if we talk about iso, I mean, isometries are properties of full nonlinear equations, right? I mean, you can. Well, but I think because really here I'm thinking about these isometries, and the picture is that somehow there is a quantum system which describes black hole, right? And there is some set of symmetries, which is a symmetry of this quantum system. And when you go to extremal black hole, it's kind of it's, you go to roughly to vacuum or quasi vacuum state of the quantum system. You see all these symmetries as, as isometries. And non-extremal black holes, well, it's just that quantum system in some non-trivial state. So still, those sy the symmetries are there. They still can they still uh, restrict properties. Of, of yeah, what, what is a general statement? But, because okay, we're not talking about some goldstone. Usually, when we have some spectral symmetry, okay, we say, oh, it's non-linear realized that goldstone, blah blah blah. Like, here it's a bit because it's just some one-dimensional thing, right? It's a different. No, but also, yeah, because I think Sorry. also here, it, as I was trying to say in the, in the beginning, I think it is my intuition that the symmetries we are talking about, we're really we're not probing just the quantum system itself, right? We're really probing how this quantum system, how is it glued to the rest of the system? How somehow the symmetry, which which is symmetry of quantum system itself, it also in this case it restricts. How you glue that quantum system to to the, to the surrounding? Well, which makes sense because at the end of the day, it all comes from gravity, right? So it's not some it's not some random gluing to 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 to, to, to the rest. So I think it, it all makes sense, but it's more subtle. Yeah, but but yeah. anyway, what's the gender? What kind of constraints do you expect in this situation where you have a non-trivial, uh, well, when a state breaks the symmetry, like you say, oh, there are still some constraints are there. So what is the least of, cons what is the least of constraints that uh, persist if the state breaks the symmetry? Well, but it's roughly that it still acts from one, from solutions, it get, you get solutions, right? So. So it's, it's, it's it has nothing to do with yeah. linearizing. I mean, said this way, it has nothing to do with linearizing the problem. No, I agree. Yeah, right. In a sense, okay, there could be some self, but again, if it calls come, yeah, I mean, one could hope, no, that it also persists for including nonlinear effects. Uh, for perturbations. But you, are, you will not be sure that uh, the solution will also belong to a SL2 representation. It may like just uh, no longer belong to the representation. Well, it's not even, it's not linear, yeah. so it's not, it's not representation. Well, it's, yeah, I don't know how to call it. Right? So it's, well, I think well, there's, a, there's some action of SL, one expects some action of SL2R on the space of solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. And you find that a static solution belongs to a particular S, SL2R, like uh, right. <clears throat> highest weight representations. Now, right. adding those uh, nonlinear terms, you find another static solution. And the question is whether those belongs to like certain SL2R representations, right? Or other representation of some other group, but just I'm saying generically, it may not. 
does not be true. It would be a miracle if it is. Yeah. Okay.